This study started as a three-arm phase one study, and it was really the first study that ever introduced checkpoint, inhi checkpoint inhibitor therapy into the Hodgkin lymphoma space. So, as I'm sure you know, most patients with Hodgkin lymphoma do extremely well, and we're able to cure many patients. But for the 15% or so of patients who relapse with Hodgkin lymphoma after first-line therapy, outcomes are much worse. So this study was an attempt to activate a dysfunctional microenvironment that tolerated the tumor and turn the tumor microenvironment from tumor tolerant to tumor targeting. So in phase one, this study had three sequential arms, all combining the antibody drug conjugate brentuximab vidotin, which is an antibody drug conjugate uh, targeting CD30, which is expressed at very high levels on Hodgkin lymphoma Reed Sternberg cells, but not on most normal cells, combined with the checkpoint inhibitors CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, and the PD-1 inhibitor, nivolumab, or in the third arm, a triplet combination of brentuximab, ipi, and nevo. The two most promising arms, brentuximab and nivolumab, and brentuximab, ipi, and nivolumab, were put forward into a randomized phase two study of 120 relapse Hodgkin lymphoma patients who were randomized one-to-one -one between the doublet of brentuximab and nivolumab and the triplet of brentuximab, ipi, and nivolumab. And that is the abstract that I presented at the ASH meeting today. So in this study, 120 patients were treated either with brentuximab and nivolumab once every three weeks at standard doses, or the addition of one milligram per kilogram of ipilimumab every 12 weeks. So just a small increased amount of ipilimumab to activate immune response. What we saw is that the therapy was very well tolerated in both arms. There was significantly more rash in the triplet ipilimumab containing arm than in the doublet arm, but most of this rash uh, was grade one to two. And at grade three, there was no grade four rash. For the grade three rashes, they were treated with topical or oral steroids and generally resolved without patients needing to come off study. The remainder of the toxicities were low in incidence and spread across the two arms. In terms of patient demographics, our demographics were evenly balanced between the two arms, with most patients having one or two prior lines of therapy and at least 50% having stage three or four disease. Our primary endpoint was complete response rate, and we saw a 6% improvement in complete response rate for the triplet compared to the doublet, which was not statistically significant. Our overall response rate, as consistent with what we had previously reported, was above 75% for both arms. When we looked at 24 months at the progression-free survival and duration of response, we saw that there was a 9% improvement at 24 months in duration of response for the responders. For for um, all patients who had had a response. This is not yet significant. This 9% improvement was not significant, but it's trending towards significance. We also looked at the impact of stem cell transplantation on patients who had this therapy and then did or did not go to transplant. And what we found was that for patients who did not go to transplant versus who did go to transplant, there was very little difference between these two populations. They were the same age, surprisingly, uh, they had the same amount of tumor burden. They had had the same response to their prior therapy, with most of them having a CR. Um, obviously, 100% of the patients who went to transplant were transplant naive, but more than 80% of the patients who went to transplant, who did not go to transplant, also had not had a transplant. So less than 15% of the patients in the non-transplant arm had gone to transplant. So these were very similar patients. What we saw for patients who did go to transplant was an extraordinary benefit for either arm if it was followed by transplant. So for patients who go to stem cell transplant following chemotherapy, the progression-free survival is something on the order of 50 to 60%. We saw upwards of 87% progression-free survival at 24 months for patients who proceeded to autologous stem cell transplant, which is a substantial improvement in what has previously been reported. And these were checkpoint naive patients, so these were not patients who had relapsed post-checkpoint, but some of them had been previously treated with brentuximab. We would, I would imagine that this is due to a sensitization effect of the checkpoint inhibitor to the beam-based autologous stem cell transplant, and so that if you couldn't combine with brentuximab, a checkpoint chemotherapy um, uh, backbone would probably do the same thing. 
For the patients who did not go to transplant, the data was quite interesting. We saw a 66% um, progression-free survival for the triplet in patients who did not go to transplant, and approximately at 24 months, a 54% uh, improvement in progression-free survival for the doublet. So progression-free survival had not been reached for either arm, and the difference between the arms was 11%. Again, not significant, but trending towards significance. So we will be following these patients for their progression-free survival DOR and their transplant outcomes for five years, as is the endpoint of the study. And we will have a lot more to say about this the next time we look at the data. We also did correlative studies from the phase one component of the study that I discussed with you in the beginning. So these are the three sequential arms. And we found a couple of interesting things. One is that we found that there were plasma cytokine levels that were associated with, with outcomes, so better or worse progression-free survival. So if you had um, a high level of VEGFR in your blood, you had a better outcome. And if you had high levels of MUX16 or CX, LCL9, you had a significantly worse outcome. We also found that at end of treatment for responders, they had significantly high numbers of plasmacytoid dendritic cells in their blood than patients who were non-responders, suggesting that patients who were responders maintained an activated immune circulating phenotype compared to patients who were non-responders who somehow uh, did not continue to have uh, immune stimulation from this therapy.